Okay. So, Sherman is advancing towards Atlanta, Mead and Grant battle the wilderness, and now they're at Spotsylvania. Now, tell a couple stories about Spotsylvania really quick. This is just an amazing battle right here. So the Confederates got there just a few hours and they dug this elaborate trench line. Yes, you can still walk the trench line, it's still there. And it's one of these trench lines, they dug a hole about three or four feet deep and then piled the dirt in a mound in front. Then every night they would put logs up in that mound. So you had a mound of wood and logs about this high. That's why they called them breastworks. Just an elaborate defense line. They realized you're out in the open, you're dead. They dug this defensive line and for a few days, the Union forces probe, trying to find a attack. Here there's about 80 yards of open ground between the forest and the Confederate line. And they were going to attack on the 11th. We didn't need to know the exact days here, but I got to tell you this because it's such just, it's just one of these really good stories from this. So here's the Confederate line. Good line, huh? Pretty good, huh? Well, they've been marching this during the way they attack, where they line up their regiments in line, march at them, and you can imagine that line of men just getting slaughtered. That's what happened at Gettysburg, at Fredericksburg. Here's the elements of this and all the way through World War One and World War Two. You know, they just thought we just overwhelmed them. Casualties were outrageous. Well, a major by the name of Emory Upton, just an interesting name, he had a regiment of about 400 men left, and he came up with this idea. He said, we line up, march in the open field, fire once, and charge, we're slaughtered. How about we do this? No preliminary bombardment. There's forest here. I have this, instead of lining up parallel, he lines his 400 men in two lines, perpendicular. They're all fixed bayonets, and he by orders, do not even load your musket, just bayonets. They'll creep up. And then they'll blow a bugle and then charge full speed at the Confederate lines. They might get one shot off before they hit the lines. They get to the lines, bayonets fixed, screaming like maniacs, then charge each direction, clear out an opening, let reinforcements come. Take them by surprise. So you're like, Yah! screaming like a maniac and get there in time. Now, this was in General Warren's Corps right here. The same guy who was on the hilltop, the same one that statue was, I made a little bit of a cry. But he heard that in this truck. And so his men snuck up there. First thing Upton had to do was find two what? Two nut jobs who will lead the charge. Because every Confederate gun is going to be fired at those two guys. And by the way, any volunteers? There's always somebody. Y'all do it, sure. And they found got there, blew the bugle, no preliminary bombardment at all, stood up and they're ah, charging full speed. Confederates were taken totally by surprise. In fact, the first guys in line weren't even hit. It happened so fast. They cleared out about 100 feet of trench line and looked like it worked perfectly, but nobody thought it would work. So there are no reinforcements to explore it. There are pushback, but it got me. And Upton, who went from major to general in one night, He's going to lead 4,000 men and attack right at this angle here. And so have four lines now of 1,000 men each. And these lines will just go straight through and go. And then they'll have 12,000 men under General Hancock, the same guy on the Union, Union Central of Gettysburg. They'll go through the opening, get behind the Confederate line, potentially destroy Lee's army, who knows how history begins. Really, it would be that shocking how that fast how it could have happened. And so, that was the plan. So, 1 o'clock on the 12th, Morehead, or up Morehead. Up the, <laughs> have his men crouch down right at the edge of the fort. Now it's about 110 yards. If you go there, you can walk it, and there's still shell hell holes there. It's, it's 100 yards of people shooting at you is a long ways. And they waited, and they blew the bugle. They stood up and charged like mad. Same thing. These first four guys, back to first ten in each line, none of them were hit. They got to the Confederate line 
cleared out 500 yards, men poured through it. It looked like it was going to work perfectly. The breakthrough was there. Confederates were running away in fear. The only problem was Hancock's Corps got lost. There's all these gullies and, and hills, and they couldn't find it. For three hours, they marched around. They could hear shooting, and they'd go to another hill, and they weren't, weren't there. And so they broke through. Confederates rode a rally, pushed them back to this line, and for the next 20 hours, they fought on that trench line, that mound of dirt and logs, for 20 hours, back and forth over this just mound, so just piled with bodies of dead and wounded men. Then it started to rain hard. And this little angle right here became known as the bloody angle. And back and forth, they charged over it. A nightmare, yeah. What was the name of the whole battle? Spotsylvania. Back and forth it went. And just dumping rain. And soon he just, um, I saw it being um, like just like mounds of men kind of pushing against each other. And they were like, men were ducking behind that mound, taking their musket and like firing into the face of the men just three or four feet across, maybe slash the bayonet. And then hand the musket back and then hand them another one. Whoever was wounded would be just go to the ground. And men would step over them. Hundreds of men drowned in the mud. Hundreds of men. It was a nightmare. Lee was able to pull his forces back and dig in, and the Union forces were able to take the trench line but not get the breakthrough. In one hundred yard section of that trench line, there were 500 bombs. To give you the idea of the ferocity of the fighting, there was an oak tree on that line. And it was split in half, cut in half by just bullets. This is pre high explosives, not cannons, bullets. Cut this tree in half. Oak tree, that's hard wood. So that's where it is. Now, the tree's at the Smithsonian Museum of American History. They cut it, and there's a, my picture of it. And you can see that little gray specks in there. Those are mini balls, the musket balls, still lodged in that tree. It's this big. And here's my picture, and this was a good time. So the first time I saw it, this was a pre-digital camera, and I had a 35 millimeter camera, and had to use a flash because it was kind of uh, dark. And you have to take a flash picture into a glass case. You have to make sure you get an angle so the flash doesn't bounce back in your face. But the problem with a 35 millimeter camera back then film, I had no idea if I took a good picture. So the picture I came home with of that almost exact same look is a picture of a flash, and in the flash embedded there in the glass was an image of me, <laughs> taking a picture of me, taking a picture of me, but went back again, and that's the great thing with the digital camera, I took about 20 pictures of it next time, and this is the copy of that, I'll let you go ahead and look at it, but you can see the musket ball still in half. Can you imagine what those are going to do to human bodies? They can cut down a tree. There are going to be over 1,000 of the dead here that can't identify. They're just mounds of flesh. Now, I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard of dog tags. We started using that term in World War II, and that's why those were invented. So they could identify the bodies. A few men had things, uh, a little metal tags made for them because they saw what happened in the and other battles. But Spotsylvania just lived in the horror of this. Eventually, both sides were exhausted. But that gives you an idea how awful the bloody angle was. So at the wilderness, there were some... It's so, it's so awful. Uh, almost 30,000 casualties. Another 30,000 casualties in Spotsylvania. 24,000 of those are Confederates. You don't even know the numbers, but if you see what's happening to the Confederate Army, where are they getting men from? So, now the race is on. Both sides exhausted. Meade is ordered to go south again. And this time, a place called Hanover Junction. Don't write this down. It's a race here. Small battle, but interior line. Lee beat him again. So now the race is to the next major road junction, which is going to be right here at Cold Harbor. Now you notice they're closer to Richmond. But that means the Union supply lines are longer, and they beat them here by seven hours and dug their most elaborate trenches yet. But Grant and me thought, we got a chance at Cold Harbor. The Confederates have lost so many men. 
If you combine disease with that, they've lost over 50,000 men in a month. The Union forces have lost 80,000 men in a month. They're bringing reinforcements, but they're running out of people. We have more people. So here's a picture of what happened here. With fresh forces, but also veterans from Spotsylvania, they were going to attack. And Meade had the very first men carry big, long, 50-foot poles with a green flag. And if they reached the Confederate lines, they're supposed to wave the flag to let Meade's men know that they reached the line and send reinforcements out. Because of the black smoke, you can't see anything. Black powder. There's a black powder musket fire. There's so much smoke. So that was the plan. Now, they were going to attack at noon on the 1st. And the men were told they're going to attack. There's a mile of open farm land in the Confederate trenches, just like right and the words of Spotsylvania hit them all. They saw, they saw those mounds of flesh. And almost all the men in Baldy Smith Corps, there's a general named, his, name was, his nickname was Baldy. He was one of those men who was bald at the age of 17. Sorry, it happens. This is all latex, so that's. But, anyways. They took a little piece of paper with them in their unit, their hometown and their parents, and pinned it to the back of the They're hoping their parents can remember it. There is a tomb at Arlington National Cemetery of unknown Union soldiers just from these battles in 1864 and 1865. There's over 12,000 lives. They have no idea. And so, they laid it out because they knew this was going to be a slaughter, but their order of not being evil. They got close to the Confederate lines, but the same deal canister shot in 20 minutes, 7,000 Union soldiers. No high explosives. This is not like World War I, but there's no machine guns, there's no smokeless powder. This is a bloodbath. 7,000 men in 20 minutes. And they never got close to the line. But someone on Meade's staff, because he wanted to credit for it, said he saw the flags. And Meade sent more men. By the end of the day, another 12,000 Union soldiers. Cold Harbor was a slaughter. So that night, when they went out to try to get the dead and wounded, on the body of one Union soldier, and these were all diary writers. Back then, the men were diaries. And on the diary of one Union soldier, it said June 1st, 1864, today I died of cold. He wrote it the night before, but he knew what was going So with that, think how many men fell. So the Confederates are nearing 60,000 men down, the Union's over 100,000 men, and it's the war still going on. What do you call it? This is the way wars are fought. When you kill and maim and hack so many of the enemy, they can't fight anymore. What is that called? Do you know? It's a word you have to know. Because this is how wars are fought. Attrition. Attrition. Where you kill, murder, attack, lead the enemy to death. Kill so many they can no longer fight. Where you kill all the enemy and you have one soldier left, you won. And this is the way wars are fought. They've always been fought this way, but they are, especially now with modern technology. They're all wars of attrition. Everybody, and everybody wants this one big battle where the generals have tactics and they go behind the enemy flank and do this and they win the war and then there's a big parade. No, it's not like that. They're bloody messes. World War I, Germany was bled to death. World War II, Germany and Japan were bled to death. Eventually, one, decide, one side says, we've lost too many people, we can't fight them anymore. It's, just, it's not working. We're done. And that's how wars are decided. The United States, the wars the U.S. have lost have all been wars by attrition. Vietnam, we've lost too many men, we're done. It's not working. Same thing just happened in the war we just were in Afghanistan. We've lost too many, it's not worth it. Just it's not worth it. Political decisions were done. 
Wars are horrific, and that's what the Union Army is eventually going to establish. But that means it's going to be a long and bloody war. Grant was hoping he could win it without attrition, win it by a big victory because the election's coming. But that will be the way the United States will win. Attrition. Just barely. But if you look at this picture, this is right after Cold Harbor, and it's one of the most canon pictures you can get in this era. If someone had to set the camera up and the tripod and get it set up. They took the pews out of the church. You see, it has to. So they're sitting on pews. And here's Grant. And you see, you notice how it kind of looks almost like there's a double face there? Right in front of him is me, General Me. And Grant is pointing at a map. And this appears to be just at the moment where Grant decides his last effort. Maybe not win the big victory on the battlefield, but hasten attrition. One last chance. By the way, you make, yeah, you kill so many of the soldiers. Couldn't that also mean kill so many civilians? You make people suffer so much they can't fight anymore. That's how wars are fought. So, here's Cold Art. We, Grant, and me. Grant orders me to fake an attack here. So what's Lee going to do? Come down here and dig trenches. But the main attack will go loop around, cross the James River, and get to the railroad junction at Petersburg. Now the Confederates knew how important this was, because they take this, the supply lines cut off. Slaves had dug some of the most elaborate trenches in the world, but there were only a couple thousand Confederate soldiers. They were called stomach soldiers. They were either sick with some kind of stomach illness. In 1864, you had just had vague stomach issues. They're sick. <laughs> or they've been wounded and they've gotten survived. And it almost worked. They came here, Confederates built the trenches, they crossed the river, and 10,000 Union soldiers were marching to face a couple thousand here. If they take Petersburg, this might hasten the end. I'm not kidding how this would change our history. The war would end it sooner, probably. Lincoln would have been elected, re elected easier. The assassination, almost impossible to imagine it happening. I mean, everything would be different. It's inconceivable. But the first core Union forces that were here was the same core, Baldy Smith's core, Cold Harbor. Just happened to be that way. Here's the pontoon bridge, a mile long. By the way, you notice this pontoon bridge at Peter's on the way here over the James? You notice that they covered this with dirt, the wooden planks over the boats? Anybody know why they covered them with dirt? Sit again. That's actually a good, and that's my first thought too, but there's not even a different answer to that. Yeah. Not a bad idea either, but horses. If they saw the gap between the wood planks, they get scared when you go. That covers it up and the horse will cross easy. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, that's one of those. Oh, okay. Watch out for that. Okay. Xerxes did the same thing. All right. And so here are the Petersburg lines after the battle. You notice how elaborate they are? When Baldy Smith's corps got there, they didn't think, oh, there's just a couple thousand troops. They thought, oh my God, it's another cold harbor. And what did he do? He hesitated 18 hours. And by the time Meade got there and ordered him to attack, oh, one more thing. Don't write these down. I typed this in so I wouldn't forget. That these Cheval de Free, this is still 15 years before barbed wire. And they put these out by the hundreds. And by the way, this I don't know if you know this, but people actually don't like to be impaled on sticks. That's science. So think about if you're a defense defensive line. They did the same thing with barbed wire or like World War II, do they barbed wire and landmines, things like that for defense? You put a bunch of these Cheval de Free here, leave an opening, put a bunch of them here. And what's the enemy going to do if they're attacking this one? You have all these Cheval de Free that is opening. What are they going to do? Won't they funnel to the opening? And you have all your cannon lined up with grape shot. Or in World War I, you have your machine guns right there. And that's, Baldy Smith saw this and he decided, I'm going to wait for reinforcements. Who arrived to the Petersburg lines in those 18 hours? The Lee and all the Confederates. So when they attacked, it was a slaughter. 
and thus it would devolve into the siege of Petersburg. And this would be trench warfare reminiscent of what you might have heard of World War I. And this would last from June 1864. Does anybody know when it would end? April 1865. June to April at Petersburg. The Union Army wasn't big enough to surround them completely. The Confederates couldn't push him back. Both sides were exact, absolutely exhausted. The casualties were unbelievably high. It went on month after month of siege. Both sides dug elaborate trenches. Here's Union guns shelling Confederate lines. Every morning, Confederate guns would shell. They'd take um, pot, shots, pot shots at each other. They would make cupolas with snipers who would pick off anybody who stuck their head above the trenches at 500 yards. So you're stuck in the trenches. In fact, all you can do is kind of look up and the men would be stuck there month after month. But think about Virginia in the summer. It rains, so the trenches are going to be covered and, I mean, just filled with muck. By the way, anybody know what fun little thing is going to happen if your foot, if your feet are in the mud all the time and wet? It's trench foot. I'll tell you more about trench foot before World War One. Where are the latrines? Where are the bathrooms for the men? Huh? If they're shelling, it's wherever you go, wherever you're at. Or there might be a little, little cut into a hole in the side of the trench and put like a blanket over it. But of course, they're going to flood all the time. Combined with bodies all over, dead horses. And we're talking rats. I don't mean, what I mean. we're talking rats <laughs> all over the place. And this went on month after month. Every time they go over, they called it going over the top and they'd attack the enemy line, it'd just be a slaughter. At night, they sent out patrols and tried to get prisoners. In fact, they had a name for the area between the trenches. What did they call it, Petersburg? You ever heard of No Man's Land? I would think of World War I, it's Petersburg. Month after month. And pretty soon you're gonna have trenches all the way from Richmond to the main line here at Petersburg. Stalemate. Remember, the Union had to look like they were going to win by 1864, and this doesn't look like victory, does it? If Lincoln loses, the U.S. is done. That's how close it is. I know it's still early summer, but we just had a man. Well, here's a couple of bits of Harper's Magazine showing them trying to protect themselves from the sun. And then winter, you can imagine how awful it would be. Here are some of the Confederate soldiers on both sides do this. They're playing cards, yeah, they keep going. And here they are. This is a pretty common gambling game where they put a hat on a bayonet and stick it up and they would bet how many bullet holes would be in the hat in, let's say, 30 seconds. Good times, huh? So they couldn't go over the top. They couldn't break the stalemate. But there was a regiment in, yes, Ambrose Burnside. Remember Burnside? His regiment, they were hard rock miners from western Pennsylvania. And they came to him with a suggestion that had been done for the credit of Vicksburg and other places. If we can't go over, why don't we go under? Get under the Confederate line, roll a bunch of black powder, and blow it up. Yeah. Yeah. But in the battle, you know, the battle could be ever directed in a battle, but overall casualties don't. Yeah. With the whole after situation, would that lead to health problems? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're all sick. Okay. So you sick. And, <laughs> and you can just imagine how fresh water was always. You, yeah. And they still didn't know, you know, germ theory was, they're literally just starting to some kind of tinker with it. You know, use carbolic acid and stuff like that. But, yeah. So, they decided to dig a tunnel. And they had to go, and this is a long way. The tunnel is going to be almost 100 yards tall. And they had to go deep enough that the Confederates couldn't hear it because they're listening for this. And they had to figure out a way to get the dirt out. It'd be about four foot high. And when they got about halfway, Burnside told me, he said, I think I got a plan. And me, like, let's do it. Why? Got to try something. And so when they got here, they finally measured it and got under the Confederate line because the Confederates hadn't figured it out. And every night they would take the dirt out, sneak it out at night, and bang, and kind of dump it behind. So 
because there are spies everywhere. And then they got under the Confederate line. They went about 50 yards in either direction under the line and then rolled in about 35 tons of black powder. Here they are rolling it in. Now, black powder is not an explosive. It ignites the gases, shoot out cannonballs or whatever, but still 35 tons. But what they thought would happen is this. They'd light it and they used a, you know, the old uh, black powder fuse, you know, like this little fuse. it blow up and it would be more like a shock wave would go through the Confederate line, maybe collapse their trenches a little bit, but knock them all cold. That's what they thought. Then they attack right there. That was the plan. By the way, in World War I, when they had high explosives, both sides tried to tunnel, and there were tunnel wars. The British or French soldiers fighting German soldiers, and heck, the British blew up an entire mountain. <laughs> what do you do when you blow up a mountain? That's your fault. But moving on. A small mountain in Belgium now. <laughs> you go there, it's like this, it's this jagged thing is still half gone. But, and then they would attack in that hole. So it's going to be on the 17th of July. And they had 4,000 fresh soldiers. And these were the most determined soldiers in the United States Army. Almost all of them were former slaves. They called them from colored regiments. And they were determined to prove their citizenship. I mean, they were just ready to go. And the plan was, well, every morning at sun, U.S. guns would shell the Confederate lines. So what would the Confederates do every morning at sun? They'd go into their bomb proof, their little shelter, wait for the shelling to come out. When the shelling went in, both sides would come out of their shell holes and dig their, and cook their breakfast. Start fires and cook their breakfast. And everybody knew. In fact, in World War I, they named for it called Live and Let Live. Why kill unless you have to? So when do you explode the mine? When they come off the ground, right? This division of, they call them colored regiment of black soldiers under command of a general by the name of Ferraro. Well, nobody's got a Ferraro. He's gonna be one of the most controversial characters in American history. He was a music teacher, I didn't know that, but he was a, abolitionist. And Ferraro was told, okay, have you been crawl up there in no man's land, huh? lay on your stomach all night, shelling, wait for, there'll be an explosion, go about the concussion, the shockwave, and then attack. Hours before they were going to crawl out, me changed his mind and replaced Ferraro's division with a division, oh, this is an A. By a general by the name of Leadley, who had been at the Wilderness, Spotsylvania. His men were at the angle. He only had 2,000 men left and replaced them. Replaced black soldiers with white soldiers. And a lot of people believe he did this because of uh, the very racist idea that existed that black soldiers would not fight. And me would be accused of, of this. And that's actually not the reason, the stupidest reason. There was a belief, and the Confederates were pushing this myth, that the United States was purposely recruiting black soldiers to get them killed. So they would all die, and the United States could be a wide republic. When we talk about the wide republic and free soilers, me didn't want to be accused of trying to purposely kill black soldiers if this turned into a swap. Levy was told, have your men crawl out and at set up would be the shelling and then attack. He was never told about the mine, the tunnel, anything. So his men followed, assuming we're all dead. Lee decided he didn't like this plan. So he did something else. Does anybody know what Lee did? He sat in one of the shelters and drank as much whiskey as a human could drink all night. So he was incapacitated the morning of the battle. And so his men crawled out, leave these getting drunk, morning shelling, and then they lit the fuse. And the fuse is about 100 yards. They lit the fuse, start snaking in. And you know what's going to happen, right? It went about halfway in one. The fuse went out. So they had to find a very fast, 
crazy and relatively short volunteer, because the tunnel's only four feet high, to go out, light it, and then run. Like I said, there's always somebody. Any, anyone? Thank you for all carrying on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. My civic duty. So, lit it, took off, run. Now remember, they thought it would be a muffled explosion, a little bit of a shock wave, and maybe the conveyor line might collapse a little bit, but that you know, go down. That's what they thought. So imagine this image. Most, almost no one knows about this except for the men around there. The men out Beely's division have no idea. The Confederates have no idea. They're just starting to their, their fire to cook their breakfast. Lit takes off running. He gets just to the edge, the opening of the tunnel. He just about ready to get there, and it goes off. And what happens? It was a little muscle explosion. The entire Confederate line just boom, the whole thing goes up. This massive explosion, a jet of flame comes through the tunnel. But the shockwave pushed him <laughs> about 100 yards, and he kind of bounced. Supposedly got up on his feet, but survived. Not even heard on this, a jet of flame after. That must have been pretty cool to see. But the whole Confederate line went on either, all through that tunnel. The whole thing, almost 100 yards of the line, went up in the air. So you can imagine wood, people, guns, cannon flying through the air. So men are all like, oh, what's happening? And all the men around him are just not cold. So there was a Confederate unit there, and they surrounded the little campfire in their trench, and that there's a smile who's cooking their, their breakfast. And boom, they get blown up. A mile away, there's a group of Union soldiers. They're behind the line. They have a campfire ring. They're cooking their breakfast, too. And all of a sudden, the explosion hit, and they're talking, God, what's happening? Stuff falling out, and they see something pretty big coming. It was getting bigger and bigger. And it's that slight. <laughs> and he supposed, this is their story now. He just kind of all of a sudden, he just clamped <laughs> on his feet, like, whoa. And they're like, whoa. And yes, they took him into a tent and charged a dime to see the flying man. That's their story. I like the story. So, Lily's men kind of got up and they start stumbling over, and what's there? A crater. Thus, the battle of the crater. This massive crater. And they go to it, and they're, I mean, they're just they're out of it. And they see this, it's 15 to 20 feet deep. And what do they do? Now, what they should do is go around. But what do they do? They go in. It's relatively easy to go in a hole. It's harder to get out of the hole. So they go across the hole and get to the edge, and it's sheer, and they can't get out. Well, Ferraro's division will be the reinforcement, and they go charging full speed into the crater, too. And soon there are thousands of men in this massive hole. By the way, Ferraro's not there. Where is Ferraro? What is the? He's back in the same bomb proof as Liebling. What is the name of the movement to try to keep people from drinking? To cut down drinking. You remember that name? Say it again. <laughs> we got so many words, I know. Transcendentalism is a philosophy of getting back to nature. Close, it begins with a T. Temperance. temperance. Yeah, you remember temperance now? He was, Ferraro was the leader of the temperance movement. And he was back in the same bomb proof trying to convince Liebling of the evils of drink. Which is so complicated. Gee, I wonder what two generals are going to be court martialed after this. But now we've got all these men in here, and they're trying to frantically they climb their way out, and the Confederates are waking up. And what do they do? You just go to the lip of the thing, you can't miss. And they're picking cannon, they're lifting the, the uh, cases up and just shooting right into it. A golden opportunity. It worked better than anyone thought, and what happened? Another disaster. By the way, that's the end of Burnside. He would be finally sent back. Totally. The Battle of the Crater just, okay, it's a, it's a great story. <laughs> but it's just another example of a horrible opportunity law, or a great opportunity horribly lost. And you know, another 7,000 Union casualties.
It's just kind of amazing what happened. And what happened? It devolved into, into stalemate. And this is what you have to write down, stalemate. See? Couldn't break it. Stalemate. And the union running on men too. The volunteers are gone. They're drafting people who don't want to go. So the war is going to have to be won in the West. Oh, that's the crater after, this is in 1865 after the Confederates retreated. See the tree, the guy sitting right there. Gives you an idea how deep it was. And he's standing on those bodies. They just kind of covered it in dirt. So it's not quite a deep, but the crater's still there. You go to the edge of it and look into it. They used to let people into it, but people just go into it, tourists. But they've decided for lots of reasons that's not good. Because uh, they still have the National Park around Petersburg is hard to all the Confederate lines. It's all still there. By the way, hear about the 20 hour uh, traffic jam in Virginia this morning? Yeah. 20 hours, people were stuck on the road. Ice storm. And at six, uh, there's all these trucks because of all the, the supply issues going on. And yeah. So it's all going to have to be decided in the West. Sherman and the West. Okay, you, what's the West? Atlanta. I know, I know, just go with it. Okay? Sherman's got to take Atlanta. And tomorrow we'll finish war because it's going to happen in a way that's kind of shocking. And I just read about that too. Yellow Book. Right, so Gettysburg, we're good on that. Everybody, turn it in early. You will get the extra credit. If I miss your thing online, but I'll try to go through and get it. Make sure I. I'll give you the points. I, I want to reward you immensely for watching this. And um, no one else takes over. No! Thank you. Yeah, and it might be a message is just going to come back. Where's my frisbee? Let's see ya. I have to be short. I
Did that? I was playing things in the set. Nobody panic. Well, you panic. We have to. 